Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Effective Process Controls. My name is Alexandra Tucci, Director of Marketing for Operations Strategy Consulting. Ever wonder what the best way to control a process is? Once you finish improving a process, you don't want all your hard work to go to waste. You know a key part of any process improvement initiative is controlling the process. How do you choose the best option for your process? In this webinar, you will learn why controls are not always as effective as they should be, the various options available to project leaders, and how to choose the best control method for your process. Presenting today's webinar will be Megan Burns, Founder and Managing Director of Operations Strategy. She has more than 15 years of industrial engineering and supply chain management experience. She has spoken at industry conferences and her articles have appeared in both regional and national publications. A certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt, Megan has worked with companies throughout North America and in 14 different countries. Before we get started, we would like you to know that there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation and you can submit your questions at any time in the box in the bottom corner of your screen. And now I will turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Alexandra. Let's start with the basics and first answer the question, what exactly are process controls? Well, process controls can be a tool. Um, they can be devices, procedures, charts. There's something that we use on a process to help it maintain its performance to be able to operate within a certain range that's considered acceptable and those can be um, fixtures in a process they could be uh, checklists they can be documents procedures control charts there are a lot of different things that we can implement or insert into a process to try and be able to control how that process performs and thereby predict how the outcome of that process will conform to our specifications or not. And that's really the whole purpose of process controls. Not that we're trying to complicate things, but really we're trying to make sure that we have good quality products and services we want to be able to um, monitor how our process is performing over a period of time. And if we make in changes or improvements to a process, we want to make sure that we're able to maintain them, that we don't go backwards um, and lose some of those gains that we have achieved by working on some type of continuous improvement project or initiative. So that's a little foundation on what process controls are and why we use them. But let's get into some of the nitty gritty here. Let's first talk about why process controls fail. Because let's face it, no one implements a process control um, thinking it's not going to achieve a, a, a desired result. So why do they sometimes fail? Why so often when we go into an organization do we find that um, you know, processes are not under control or that they're not performing adequately even if there are controls in place? And the three main reasons that we have seen why process controls fail are first, they're controlling the wrong part of the process. Uh, second, the data that they're using in their process controls is simply not timely enough. And thirdly, are the individuals who are performing the process don't have the appropriate authority. So let's go through each of these in some more detail so that when you're looking at your own processes, you can evaluate if you might be falling into some of these pitfalls and how to avoid that. Okay, the first reason why process controls fail is that we have the wrong focus, meaning we're controlling the wrong part of the process. And what you see here is uh, this classic formula of Y is a function of X, meaning 
anytime we have a process, we have a series of steps of inputs, which are our X's. And they are independent. There are inputs. Uh, if we have a problem, these are usually the causes to our problems. The Y's are the outputs of that process. What happens once we've completed the process? And as a result, it's dependent on all of our X's. It's an output. And when we have problems there, when we see the effects of the problem or the symptoms in the output, so what does this mean in terms of process controls? Here's what it means. Most um, people, when they're initially looking at process controls, if they don't have any background in it, they focus on the output. They focus on the whys of the process. And that's what they try to control. The problem is, as we see here, that the Y is dependent on all of those X's that go into creating the output. So all we can ever do is monitor the Y. Here, let me give you an example. How many times have you heard someone talk about on-time customer delivery? and how important a metric of on-time customer delivery is. And let's face it, it's an important metric. However, on-time customer delivery is a function of a multitude of other processes and inputs. It's a function of material availability. It's a function of capacity. Uh, if we're in an opera operational environment, um, equipment downtime, labor availability, uh, product mix, all of these other factors influence and affect whether we deliver on time or not. So if we want to look at improving on-time customer delivery, we don't want to put our control on on-time customer delivery. We can monitor that but we can't control it. We need to go further back into the process and understand what is our big driver? Is it um, machine downtime? Is it product mix? Is it material availability? And that's what we need to put our controls around because those are the independent inputs that we can actually have an effect on. And if we can control that, then we can predict or um, have a strong confidence in what our output would be. So that's one of the first mistakes that we see. You're controlling the wrong part of the process. So when you're looking at your process controls, go back and ask yourself, when I look at this process, are we trying to control the output or those critical key inputs? because you can only ever monitor the output. Your controls must be on your inputs. Now, the second mistake that we see people making is that their data is simply not timely. And we have this little continuum here on the slide talking about how timely is your data that you're using in your process control? Is it real time? Do you actually have um, the capability in your process and your systems to be able to measure and track the data in real time and get feedback to it? Uh, is it something that you're monitoring on an hourly basis or a shift by shift basis? Uh, maybe you're gathering data and then reporting it back on a daily basis. Uh, we've seen places where it's weekly, it's updated on a weekly basis, uh, and, and even longer. Here's the, here's the problem. Depending on the cycle time of your process, and really, that's a big factor. Uh, you know, Real-time data is much more important when you are processing, say, 60,000 bottles an hour as opposed to if you're machining a part and it takes five hours of machine time, um, then, then you could probably report or gather data on a maybe a shift by shift basis. But look at your process, look at your cycle time and your volumes and say, okay, how real time or how 
um, how well does our data reflect the time aspect because here's what you don't want to do if you're in that position where you're producing 60,000 bottles an hour you don't want to be gathering and reporting data on a weekly basis you don't even want to be doing it on a daily basis because think about how many units have we produced in that amount of time and if our process is out of control what is the potential for all the defects that could have gotten out? So you really want to make sure that your your data that you're using in your process controls is timely enough that you can react to it, that you can make adjustments to your process so that you're not uh, operating in an out of control condition for any length of time where you could be harming um, or potentially producing bad product that's going to go out to your customer or increase your rework and scrap rates. The third mistake that we see is that the individuals who are doing the processes, operating the processes, um, simply don't have the necessary authority to make the process controls effective. So you can have fabulous process controls designed and implemented. However, if the people who are operating or performing those processes on a day-to-day -day basis don't have visibility to them, they don't see them. Uh, if you're using SPC charts or you're using some other control method uh, and they don't, ha they can't see them, they don't have any insight to them, that's not going to help control your process. Similarly, um, they need to understand the process control. So if you redesign a process uh, to eliminate a certain part of the process to eliminate the defect uh, and they don't understand why that was done and they create workarounds, that's going to make your process controls much less effective. Um, if they don't understand how to read SPC charts, if they don't understand the procedures, obviously you have now made your process controls that much less effective. Uh, the last two are the ones where sometimes people get hung up, is they give their operators and their employees visibility to the process controls. They explain them to them. However, they may not have the authority to stop the process when there's a problem. They don't have the authority to begin investigating the root causes so they can correct the out of control condition. Uh, the classic example of this is the Toyota production system and where line employees have the authority when there's a problem, when there's a defect, when there's an out of control condition to shut down the production line. And that's what the goal is. And the question is, are we giving our own team, our own employees, that kind of authority to be able to shut down the line when there's a problem so we can figure out why it's there, correct it, and get back up and running? So let's look at the continuum of process controls. And here we have a list of all the different types of process controls that are out there from the best, the most effective to the worst and the least effective. And you'll see the most effective process controls at the top are our type 1 and type 2 corrective actions. And we'll go into some detail what these look like. But they're basically when you have a countermeasure, you're redesigning the process or you flag uh, the operator or someone when there is a problem in the process. Notice SPC, statistical process control charts, that people can get so enamored with are ranked down at number three in terms of effectiveness. And that's only when they're implemented correctly. And then as we go down, notice inspection that so many people like to rely on is ranked number four. We have SPCs when we don't have the authority that we just spoke about down at number five. SOPs, standard operating procedures. How many organizations rely on SOPs to control their processes? 
And if we look at that, that's down at number six in terms of effectiveness. And down at the bottom uh, is SPCs, statistical process control charts that are effectively wallpaper. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. But this is a good slide to go back to whenever you're looking at your process and you're trying to determine what is the best process control for this particular instance. And you can see what's going to be uh, the most effective. Now, as I said, the best process control that you can implement is a corrective action, also known as a pokey yoke. Okay, mistake proofing. Some people like to call it dummy proofing. And these take two different forms. Um, the type one corrective action is actually a countermeasure. This is where you redesign the process so you completely eliminate the error condition. The type two corrective action is a flag, some type of an alert that you're about to create a defect or a defect was created and you shut down the line before it moves any further down through the process. Uh, now uh, we have, if you want to know more about polka yolks, uh, we, ha we cover them in our root cause analysis course, which you can attend uh, in public or online. Uh, and we also cover it in our Six Sigma courses and our Lean courses. So if you want to learn more about that, you may want to check those out uh, if you want to get some more details on that. But when we're talking about type 1 corrective actions, these countermeasures, here's an example. Uh, at one point, I was working on a project where we were having problems with armature coils failing. They were shorting and grounding, and uh, we were trying to figure out where in the process the defect was occurring. We, our in-house testing rate, they were failing at about 25%. So what we ended up doing is because we could not find the exact point in the process where the defect was occurring, we redesigned the armature coil so that it was impossible for those two copper wires to come into contact with each other. And that way it eliminated the error condition. So anytime you make it impossible for the defect to occur, that is the best possible way to control a process. I know it's not as fancy and um, cool as an SPC chart, but it is the most effective way to control your process. Now the type 2 corrective action is the flag, the alert. And the example we give with this is there was a company that had a problem with its packaging line and they were not getting the staples or enough staples in the bottom of their product cases and in the shipping department and so the problem was the product was falling out of the case, there was all kind of damage going on. So what they did was they put a metal detecting sensor immediately after the lower packing me packaging mechanism. And then they hooked it up to a little counter and programmed in some logic that they had to detect at least six staples in the bottom of the product case before it went any further. And if it didn't, a little rubber stopper came up stop the production line so that that product case could not go any further down the line and it could be corrected. So again, not anything terribly fancy. We're talking about something like a metal sensor uh, and a little rubber stopper. So when we're looking at the most effective controls, this is the best way to control a process, some type of a pokey yoke design. Now let's say you, it's not possible to do a pokey yoke or uh, you, you've just decided that's not the best control for your particular process. The third most effective control and the one that people think of most often are SPC charts, statistical process control charts. And here we have an example of an IMR chart. These are effective and these are third in effectiveness when they are correctly implemented. So what does that mean? 
That means you have your operators who are fully trained. Your SPC charts are on the X's. You're only monitoring your Y's. Operators understand how to read the charts, how to interpret the charts. They understand that they cannot be over or trying to um, over optimize the process. You have timely data. And if the process goes out of control, whoever is operating that process has the authority to stop it for investigation, to understand why it's out of control. They go to their out of control action plan to be able to make corrections. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned before, if you want to learn more about the SPC, check out our online SPC class or visit one of our public courses that we offer for statistical process control uh, or, or one of our Six Sigma courses. And we can go into all kinds of details on how to create and effectively use SPC charts. So what process controls should you avoid? Well, when we look at our continuum of effectiveness, seven out of eight, number seven, with standard operating procedures. Now, let me just say before half of you jump out of your out of your seats, standard operating procedures are a good tool for documenting your process. They're a good tool for training new employees. So don't say, oh, I went to this webinar and Megan Burns said that we need to get rid of all of our SOPs because they're not effective. That's not what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying is they are good within a certain range. They're effective for training. They're effective for documentation. They are not effective for process controls. And unfortunately, sometimes that's what we see. We'll see organizations write down or they have their SOPs, require all of their employees to read them and sign off that they read the SOP and figure that's an effective control for the next six months, 12 months, however long that employee is going to operate that process until it changes. That is not an effective control because people don't remember what they read for that length of time. Quite honestly, people don't remember what they read 24 hours after they read it. So this is not a long-term process control. Should you have documentation in place? Yes. But in terms of a process control, go look at the Pokeyoke, go look at the um, correctly implemented SPC charts. Do not rely on SOPs as a process control. And here's the other reason why, let me just add this. For SOPs to even try to be effective, you need to have accountability. And most organizations, unless you're working in the military, which I will say is the only place I have seen SOPs implemented effectively, is because you do not have uh, your frontline supervisors or your managers holding people accountable on a daily basis or an hourly basis to the standard operating procedures. And even at that point, it's it, in the civilian world, I have not seen it implemented effectively, even using that strategy. The other process control you want to avoid are SPCs, statistical process control charts, that are effectively wallpaper. And what I mean by this is when you have SPC charts on your Ys, your outputs thinking you can control them, or your X's, but no one looks at them, no one is trained to take action on them, no one has the authority to take action on them, and your data is not timely. And I have actually seen this, I've actually seen an organization that had an entire wall, um, probably about 20 feet long, maybe 15, from uh, probably about two feet off the floor up to about maybe six feet, seven feet off the floor, filled with SPC charts. And here's the thing, it wasn't in the, um, on the shop floor or anything like that, it was in the hallway between the parking lot 
and the time clock for people to punch in. No one looked at them. The data was updated uh, maybe every two weeks. But no one looked at them. No one took action on them. All they were was hung up there so when customers came in, the organization could say, hey, look at all of our SPC charts. This is how we control our processes. How good. Um, look at how awesome we are. It was the epitome of wallpaper uh, because it really did nothing to control the process. And so if you're looking at SPC charts, please, 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 please make sure that they are in a place where people actually look at them, they understand them, they take action on them, and you have timely data for it. Okay, um, before we get to our last part in making sure you imp how to implement process controls effectively, let me just pause here because I know I've already mentioned a couple things about uh, where you can go from here. Go to our website. If you're not receiving our newsletter, uh, sign up and you will get all kinds of resources, articles. Uh, you'll get our calendar of events, upcoming public training, when we launch new online courses. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can continue to further your education or just your knowledge on these subjects beyond today. Uh, secondly, go subscribe to our YouTube channel. We post all of our webinars up on our YouTube channel, so if you miss one or you want to uh, view it again, you can go there. Similarly, uh, we also post short five-minute videos just on different topics uh, to answer some questions that we get from clients. That's another thing you can do. And then finally, uh, while you're on our website signing up for our newsletter check out our training page because we are always adding courses to our online training catalog and again that's another way to continue your knowledge and uh, your understanding of these different subjects okay so finally how do you actually implement process control successfully well, the very first thing is you have to make sure you choose the correct control for your process, so, which means you cannot just make a blanket statement that we're going to implement, uh, you know, a type one corrective action, which is the uh, pokey yoke where you eliminate the defect condition on every single process. That, that's just not practical. So you need to look at each individual process and, and say, what is the best control for this particular process or for this particular moment in time? I gave you the example about the problem with the packaging mechanism where they put the uh, metal detecting sensor. That was a short-term solution. Uh, the long-term solution was actually a type 1 corrective measure, which was they were going to eliminate that part of the packaging line and transition from inserting staples to just gluing the bottom of the box. Um, but that involved a lot of capital expenditure and there was a lot of time involved in it. So when you look at your processes, think about what is the best solution for right now for this process and then you can change that or add to it later. Secondly, make sure everyone who's involved is trained trained on what the process control is, what they're supposed to do when the process goes out of control, how to interpret things, and make sure they have the authority to actually go do it. Um, because that's where the effectiveness of the process control really comes into play. And finally, make sure it's timely. Make sure your data is timely. Make sure the reporting is timely. Make sure uh, it's appropriate for your particular environment, your cycle time, your volumes. Uh, otherwise, again, your process controls are simply not going to be as effective as they can. Well, thank you very much for sitting with us through this webinar. Again, here's you can get more information uh, at our website or you can email us. And at this point, I'm going to open it up for some questions.